can it really exist? The Elysium and the creator that lives there. A land of plenty atop the world tree. If such a place did exist, humanity could live in peace without worrying about the titans dying. Without needing to fight over resources like the Morardane and Uriah conflict. A life without war, loss and suffering. If the Divine Architect could see them now, I wonder what he would think. Aegises were the master blades created as information processing units, shaping the fabric of all rest, the cycle of life and death as Numa and Logos, hope and despair. Only a worthy driver that embodied their respective worldviews could resonate with them, the emotions they carry, just like how Alpha used Niall's disdain for the city people to strengthen his will. It is the same in all rest. Aegis's need their physical vessels. The Torning King's brother failed to resonate with Numa's core for the same reason that Amalthus failed, as their hearts and minds were shrouded with jealousy, hatred, and distrust. To be fair, the world of all rest wasn't kind to them, and in turn they lashed out in anger and despair. As Zed says, if the results satisfy, it is well and good, but if they do not satisfy, what then? Will you weep better by grief, or howl seething with rage? Adam's star is rising. It seems that the people love him. Huh. And naught but the fruit of the king's whimsy and an obscure woman. Yet if only he were not the driver of the Aegis. You know you can't control it. Amalthus's mother was raped and killed in the brigands' camp in times of war. Despite his best efforts, Malos was the only Aegis he was able to bond with because the darkness in his heart, born at an early age, prevented him from optimism, hope, and trust in his fellow humans. Unlike Rex, he wasn't fit to represent Numa. See, life is not always in our hands, not under our control. As hard as it may be, the child of Malthus wasn't facing the truth. Even if he could spend an eternity with his mother, he wouldn't be able to save her still. Just as N wasn't able to save M from despair, even after being granted an eternity. The child of Malthus would not be able to save her mother, even in his endless now. It is unbearable seeing life slip away from you, even though they're right there. What are we even doing? Trying to live life, knowing the meaninglessness of it all in the face of death. These were the questions that ate away at Amalthus. That's why he crushed the brigand's head with a rock, as the seeds of darkness and despair were already planted. Yet, trying to find meaning and optimism in a meaningless world is what this young salvager does for a living. Rex, somehow still living with hope in a green world where the titans are dying slowly but surely. If anyone was living there? It seems not. And if there had been, they would have all left by now. 
makes sense. Hey, Gramps. Do you think Fonset Village will be gone too one day? It would not be today or tomorrow, but one day, yes, it will fall. And you too? That's how it goes with us Titans. Eventually, there'll be nowhere left to live. The world tree, piercing the heavens. This, this is the world they call home. All rest. The story goes that when the world was young, everyone in all rest lived on the tree, together with the divine father, the architect. According to the tales, it was a bountiful land, and the people there held the power to command even the heavens themselves. They called that paradise Elysium. But then one day they were cast out. Nobody knows why. Maybe they angered the architect. Maybe it was a fall from grace, as all we know is that they were forced to leave Elysium to live here in all rest, where it turns out life is pretty hard. When it seemed like humanity would surely die out, the architect took pity on them, sending his servants, the Titans, to save them. The few of them who survived settled on the Titans and they lived in harmony ever since. But now those Titans are beginning to die out. As Minoth says, both Malos and Numa were divine revelations brought down from Elysium. But what kind of revelation is this? What kind of salvation? Could anyone call what Malus did to Torna salvation? His hope caused this, or his despair. While Malus was a being on the precipice of despair, staring directly into the abyss, the abyss stared right back at him. But what about Mithra? She had no answer for Minoth when asked what her purpose in this world was. Why did the architect create Numa? The superego of the information processing units, emphasizing compassion, empathy, and selflessness. And she had no idea what to identify herself with in a world without meaning. I heard he went climbing up the world tree not long after. And brought divine revelations back with him. You mean... The Aegis. Malos. But what kind of revelation is this? What kind of salvation? Could anyone call this salvation? His hope caused this. Or his despair. Despair? How about you then? You're from the same stock? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm just following this guy since he woke me up, and that's basically it. I have no particular interest in this world or its future. Maybe what Mithra needed to realize her purpose was to bond with someone that embodied hope, optimism, and we know that Adam wasn't good enough to be able to summon the true form of the Aegis. Just like Malos, Mithra was hesitant in trusting humanity so readily. What Minoth said bothered Mithra. She could sense why Malos was destroying humanity. She understood that even in the depths of madness, there is a taint of genius. A taint of truth. But she also wasn't sure if Malos had all the answers. Whenever she looked at humanity, she saw the same darkness. What if all this, the fighting for resources, the absurdity of life, creating pain and suffering, is what a mouth is? No. What all of humanity really wants. 
He seemed very human, protecting his heart with a mask of lies. Are you curious what's behind it? Not really. Most humans are like that, aren't they? What Minoth said bothered me. I think he was talking about Malos, but his words could just as easily have applied to a Malthus. I suppose. What if all of this is what a Malthus... No. What all of humanity really wants? As you can see, right in front of Indol's refugee camps, people are fighting over resources. The strong are bullying the weak. So, is this the best? humanity can hope for? The tyrannical will of Mobius. She believes this to be the core of Malos and Malthus, the will of humanity. After all, Anne wielded Malos in despair in Ionios. Logos was what the world chose without a god in Xenoblade 3. And Mithra in this scene realized that darkness to be something even she embodied. We all have a bit of Mobius inside. As Mithra saw things as they are, but didn't know what to do. Until that moment. Just go, Rex! Remember to fight! YOUR WAR! Van Damme! Oh, please. What a cliché. Yeah! For this, for Van Damme. No, you have to go. You're a pain in the ass, little shit. I can't do it, Rex. Rex, Rex. Can't let you do this. So long, kid. While the Tornin King's son, Adam, wasn't the one to ultimately mature Mithra, a random nobody salvager was. As in this world, edge to bleeding edge filled with sorrow, all that matters is the purity of your will. Rex was almost going to waste the gift of life Van Dam left them with. Even after being beaten down, even knowing he had no strength to oppose Malos, he stood his ground the best he could. It was naive, but admirable. And maybe that's all Mithra needed. The desire to protect despite your individual safety was so strong at this moment that Mithra reconsidered her opinions on humanity. She could now take away the mask that was Pyra and unleash her true form because otherwise, Malos, the darkness she feared, would win. At the end of the day, if Mithra wants a better world, if she wants to get to Elysium, if she wants to fix the mistakes she did back in Torn's destruction, then she needs to work for it. Numa needs to earn it. As Jin said over T, Mithra's affinity lies in the future, not right now. The true connection that's meant for you, I don't think you'll find it here. But Adam's my driver. Sure, he is. But I feel it's not the same, somehow. Huh? Your real affinity lies in the future, not in the time we're in now. I just feel that in my bones. 
rather than trying to reach for a paradise up in the sky that no one really knows it exists, maybe she could work with humanity to make the Allrest itself the fabled land of Elysium. Maybe Elysium could be right here, as long as she held on to the optimism this random salvager showed. By using that, maybe humanity can work through the kinks of its armor. Because it's funny that while Mithra took her purpose seriously, trying to carve a path for herself, Malos was acting like a little child. Mithra asked Malos why he's doing all this, if this is just a game to him, and Malos gives a familiar answer for all Xenoblade 3 players. An easy cure for the tedium of being. As for the why he does all this, it's because it amuses him. Is this a game to you? Yeah, it's a game. An easy cure for the tedium of being. As for the why, it's because it amuses me. Zets being fear and Malos being hatred, it made no difference. They all enjoyed hedonism just the same. The short sighted and temporary pleasures of life. As by nature, delayed gratification is a value lost on Logos in it. In the midst of anxiety and selfishness, there is no foresight. This is interesting because Mithra allows for the skill of foresight to Rex, which enables him to see the future for long enough to be able to react skillfully, not unlike Shulk's Monado. This is something that Malos can never do. He lacks foresight. His nature as id focuses on the past of petty hatreds, betrayals, and a sense of vengeance. But these emotions lose their power over you when you let bygones be bygones. You don't cling to the past or to the endless now, but allow the passage of time to heal your wounds. That's what Numa does, and siding with Mobius, Malos desired eternity for certainty, security, and control. Speaking with Amalthus, Malus concluded that humans aren't fit to breathe their air. Indeed, the city people in Ionios were also not fit to breathe their air. Mobius were the superior race, and didn't hesitate for a second killing the city people. He didn't care about their lives, the children and the families. All N desired is eternity with M, and for all he cares, the rest of the world can burn away in oblivion. That's what Malos does. Gondor in this scene helped push back against Malos's misanthropic and selfish worldview, as and could look for a way to save them all like Matthew did, but he didn't choose that. He could align with the Ouroboros, but for Malos, he was just clearing out the worthless. Isn't that why Amalthus sought out the architect in the first place? Why he climbed the world tree? Didn't he crush the brigand's head with a rock as a child because of the hatred and despair for what they've done to his innocent mother? Malus could understand the darkness that resided in that child Amalthus deeper than maybe he ever could. I've got full control of all my powers now. It doesn't matter if you die. I can keep on going. What are you saying, Malos? The Praetorium, the Believers, I despise them all. Humans aren't fit to breathe our air. So, I'm going to give you what you always wanted. But I never... I'm clearing out the worthless. Isn't that why you sought the architect? Why you climbed the world tree? Yet look at you now. <sighs> Due to this selfishness and hatred, 
Logos has the tendency to stand alone as an individual, while Numa is the one who works together collectively with others, as nothing exists in isolation after all. Malus and Mithra may be evenly matched, but with like-minded people on Mithra's side, it tips the balance on one side. There is strength in numbers. This is a very good reference to how N was alone, facing Noah's party in chapter 7. Even M left him at the end. See, Malus's selfishness created a barrier around him that repelled others, or at least put them in arm's distance, never really relating to humanity with integrity after becoming a Mobius. In Ionios, Malus and N were in their pits of despair, trying to convince themselves that eternity was the correct choice. I wasn't... I wasn't mistaken. When I tried to give her eternity, that was the correct choice. And you ruined it! Because you've changed! <gasps> Why are you the ones who get to stand there together in this world, edge to bleeding edge filled with sorrow? Looking at this scene, I initially thought the destruction of Torna was Malus's doing because of the purple explosions. But to my surprise, this was a clever foreshadowing of Numa instead, alluding to how even the power to protect can destroy if not used judiciously. In the Aegis War, Adam couldn't control Mithra's powers, he couldn't guide her and she destroyed the land of Torna and its people. As Pyra made the destructive nature of herself and Malos clear back at the theater. Malos and I are Aegises. Blades born with a terrible power, strong enough to destroy the world. As a result, Adam sealed away Mithra at the depths of the Cloud Sea, so that Numa's destructive power could never fall into the wrong hands. Are the Aegises eternal? Well, the Aegis War was not the end for Malos. As long as people existed, so would strife, conflict and selfishness. The Logos core would live on, to find something to feed from. Malus dying won't necessarily be enough to bring peace to the world. That I am certain of. As long as there are people, there will always be strife. I suppose. Don't say that. Things can change. There's always hope. Don't you think, Jin? Yes, you're right. As long as... Blades and humans... are bonded to each other. Surely... someday... What breaks Mithra's heart so much is that before the Aegis War, she explicitly said to Milton that he would be safer staying indoors how much of a distraction they would be while fighting Malos. And he purposefully taunted Mithra to unleash the unstable power of the Aegis. Lots of unintended casualties occurred in the ensuing chaos. Great power really comes with great responsibility. Milton died as a result. The innocent child she specifically instructed to stay out of the way to be safe, only to kill him regardless with her own hands. Milton told Mithra countless times that her technique was lacking and as the Aegis she never really cared about those other than herself that she had a superiority complex. Even Mithra herself told Adam that she had no purpose in life, she had no real investment in the human race. She acted detached, cold and selfish, not unlike Malos, 
which is precisely why she was baited in the Aegis War. Malos pushed all of her buttons and got what he wanted. The id prevailed over the superego. You might think that Malos dying means Mithra won, but I suggest it was the other way around. Mithra lost everything that day. She lost her purpose, her dignity, her will, her reason for living. Whether Torna's demise were intentional or by accident, the final straw that broke the camel's back was Mikhail pulling Milton closer to him as Mithra tried to reach out for him. Just as Noah said, do you think an officer can ever reach others? Even if you could reach people, you wouldn't be able to save them. Mithra hoped by reaching out to Milton, by touching him, she could maybe bring him back. Mikhail knew that Mithra messed up. If Adam could guide her better, if she got off her high horse for just a moment, Milton could be alive right now. Just like Rex, Mithra unintentionally hurt others she loved despite wanting to protect them. Mikhail's little tug of Milton broke Mithra completely and resulted in the sealed consciousness that we now know her under as Pyra. In Chapter 3, Mithra saw herself in Rex at that moment, fighting for others naively while risking their safety. Look at the state of you. <sighs> you hadn't even noticed. Your own blade has been wounded so deeply. And all you can think of is yourself. Uh... You awakened the Aegis. I thought you might have been different. But you're just... A fool. Uh... A pitiful childish fool and maybe that's why she woke up to prevent Rex from making the same mistakes she did 500 years ago to spare him the agony of what ifs and if onlys I got a question for you what is the purpose of life why do we exist in the first place the French philosopher Albert Camus proposed the idea of absurdity, how humanity is a species driven by a desire to have meaning, but ironically live in a meaningless world. The universe doesn't care who you are, what you do or what you will do. It exists perfectly as it is, completely content and satisfied. To cope with this, you have two options. You can choose to be lost in the abyss of despair, seeing the meaninglessness to be so absurd that you can't find a reason to live. Albert Camus likens this to nihilistic rebellion, the amalthuses and malices of the world. There is an undeniable madness and pessimism in these people. While the opposing side is keeping the flame of hope alive, seeing the meaninglessness as an opportunity to create his own. Existentialism arises from this hope. Albert Camus likens this to the genuine rebellion, the true rebellion, the Rexes and Numas of the world. Usually there is an undeniable selflessness and childlike optimism in these people. The architect describes the absurdity in all rest, the inherent identity confusion we all experience in a subtle but profound way. When a person loses something, they cannot help but seek a reason why, within themselves or in others. They seek a concrete answer to the question of who they really are, deep inside. 
such a very lonely existence. But perhaps that is what it is to be human. Amalthus really wasn't kidding when he said, Oh, architect, is this the world that you intended? After Amalthus climbed the world tree, there was no one there. He had no reason to believe in a god as he knocked on the door and got no answer. There was no salvation or a god to place his hope for a better future. All his life, his education, his religion, his friends, his goals, he deluded himself with it all, he thought. The suffering of humanity was meaningless. He snatched away the new mind logos cores and brought it down to all rest. He took it upon himself to fix what he deemed as bad and ugly. If there was no god in this world, he could become one with the Aegis to fix the shattered world. As Amalthus wanted power so that he could purify humanity with a genocide, he poisoned and assassinated his way into power in Torna, usurped the status of Praetor as he was playing the god the world deserved. After rising to power, Amalthus feared Numa, who killed Malos. He no longer had any use for her and desired to destroy Torna alongside her. While trying to escape, Laura was caught in the crossfire. But the tragedy is that Numa was nowhere to be found in the first place. Pyra was already below the Cloud Sea, hidden from the prying eyes, which means Laura's death was for nothing. Seeing the fragility of life, losing the only person he loved, seeing the absurdity of it all, Jin sided with Malos to take vengeance upon this world. Jin desired an eternity with Laura, became a flesh eater to immortalize her in a world where Blades were forgetting their identity after their drivers died. Being forgotten was a fate worse than death. Why were the humans the masters and Blades the slaves? What an unfair system that the architect created. He lost all faith in humanity just like Amalthus. Jin and Malos in all rest were the perfect reflections for Anne and Malos in Ionios. They represented the exact same will and despair. The true rebellion, on the other hand, recognizes the flaws of existence. You accept the pain of life and let it go. If there is no meaning, you create one. You embrace hope by finding beauty, and if there is none, you attempt to create one as well. The true rebel understands the power of interpretations and actively creates his role in this world. He is proactive rather than reactive. He understands that existence precedes essence. Essence means purpose. Your existence comes first and then you create a meaning of your own. That's what Rex and Mithra do. While the nihilistic rebel states that Essence precedes existence. Your purpose comes first, baked into your life. But if there is no meaning in life, the only way you can justify your existence is to embrace hedonism and selfishness in the absolute sense. That's what Amalthus and Malus concludes. Malus wonders what is it that gets Rex wake up in the morning. What is it that Rex sees in life that he can't see? That's why he says, why don't you just let it go? Who do you think you're doing this for? As he has no idea how someone can live with hope in such a grim world. Why don't you just let it go? Who do you think you're doing this for? 
Rex does what he does for himself if it helps to put smiles to people's faces, helps to live their lives together in peace, to bring a bit of joy into their lives, whether as a salvager, a friend, or a lover. Rex is a true rebel against the absurdity, as Albert Camus likes to say. He believes that it is possible to forgive the unforgiven, to accept the darkness of humanity and see light beyond it. You can even be that light yourself. At least, that's the role Rex created for himself, since existence precedes essence. I'm doing it for myself. If it helps put smiles on people's faces, helps them live their lives together, then that's my role in this world! What is the alternative? The essence preceding existence. What happens when someone doesn't know how to create meaning? What if, like a pencil, you believe that your existence relies on a predefined purpose? yet you still have no idea how to live that purpose. There's a term Aegises like to identify with. The Endbringer. Especially Malos loves this word. But my question is, what end are we talking about? Ending the cycle of violence and tyranny? Or ending the cycle of peace and democracy? Both are Endbringers in completely different contexts. Malos mistakenly believes how he has a predefined purpose as an endbringer, how the architect willed it so, to destroy the world and the people in it. But the architect never specified what is it that Malus was to be the endbringer of. As all compassionate and loving creators do, he gave that choice for Malos to make. He trusted his free will to come to a conclusion of his own, just like Mithra did for herself in Torna and all rest. What are we in the end? This hunger I feel, this thirst, is it really my own or is it someone else's? <sighs> Sometimes I can't tell. Tell me, Jin. Are you really here? I don't know where I really am. Despite not accomplishing his purpose as an endbringer, right before his death, Malus looked so content and satisfied. Maybe he realized his essence, his purpose, was something he willed it into existence, not the other way around. And considering Malus was the endbringer that never was, protecting the endless now in Ionios, I think it's safe to say that Malus learned how to finally exercise his agency and free will. There was only one driver for me. All in all, it wasn't so bad. I'm gonna be honest, it was not easy to make this video, so if you want me to make more, give this video a like and subscribe, share it with your friends and tell me your thoughts in the comments below. Before you go, I suggest you watch my Xenoblade 3 Nihilism episode right here, as it is personally one of my favorites. That's it for me today, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.